Good morning. My name is Jim Cruzan, and I'm the Vice President of Content for the PMI Media Group, publishers of Packaging World, Healthcare Packaging, Automation World, and Pro Food World. I'm also the publisher for OEM, the official magazine of PMMI, who produces the portfolio of PAC Expo shows in the U.S., as well as PAC, uh, Expo PAC Mexico. And the next PAC Expo Las Vegas is in uh, September 23rd through 25th this fall. Uh, all right, the Center for Disease Control estimates that each year in the U.S., 48 million people get sick from a foodborne illness. 128,000 are serious enough to be hospitalized, and 3,000 people die. Researchers have identified more than 250 foodborne diseases. Most of them are infectious, caused by a variety of bacteria and viruses and parasites. Harmful toxins and chemicals also can contaminate foods and cause foodborne illness. For any CPG, these types of incidents can be disastrous for the brand. In this place, CIP is a widely utilized practice especially for systems that process food, dairy, beverages, and pet food. But CIP is also employed for cosmetics and personal care products, pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, and biotech. Well-designed CIP systems can help meet the challenges of complying with the Food Safety Modernization Act. FSMA outlines recommendations on cleaning and sanitation, as well as sanitation, preventive controls, and verification. This webinar is designed to help consumer packaged goods manufacturers understand and successfully use CIP systems. Our guests today are Caitlin Lucia, Senior Process Engineer on the Global Engineering Team for Campbell Soup. Caitlin has been a process engineer for Campbell's for the past six years and previously worked as a project engineer for Cargill. Her focus has been in aseptic processing and cleaning of aseptic processing systems. Brian Downer, Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Santamatic, began his career as a hygienic process system engineer over two decades ago. He has designed and implemented processes and cleaning systems for a variety of beverage, food, and biopharmaceutical companies. Now let me turn it over to Dr. Stephen Perry, one of the managing directors of PMMI's OPEX Leadership Network. And I'd also like to say a special thanks to our sponsor, Emerson, for making today's webinar possible. Dr. Perry? Good morning, everyone. Jim, thank you so much. Um, uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, <clears throat> start off uh, by talking a little bit about the purpose of today's webinar. Uh, you can see on the slide there are four key areas that we want to, uh, to cover uh, today. Uh, first, there is an update on PMMI's op X Leadership Network, which I'll provide for you in just a moment. Secondly, we want to give uh, with our panel a sort of a general introduction to CIP uh, and then a guidance, uh, uh, some guidance that's contained in the document for CIP, uh, and then give the audience time for a little bit of, uh, of question and answers. Um, if we could get to our next slide, um, we'll uh, go to uh, operational excellence uh, in, in 2011, uh, PMMI uh, developed the uh, OPEX Leadership Network. Uh, as you can see on the, uh, the next slide, the operational excellence slide, operational excellence uh, bases, uh, based on a philosophy of leadership uh, that derives the deliberate, intentional, and sustainable improvement of production operations in three key areas, focusing on the needs of the customer, uh, secondly, empowering employees, and then optimizing processes. Um, the OPEX Leadership Network is a network uh, of uh, predominantly CPGs and uh, PMMI members, OEMs, and suppliers uh, to provide networking and tools to facilitate the communication between suppliers and end users. Currently, there are more than 250 companies that are collaborating on these documents, uh, and primarily the documents are designed to develop best practices and protocols. And by the way, they are free for industry-wide adoption. Uh, at the end of the um, webinar today, we will provide the website, the OPEX Leadership Network.org website, where all of these uh, documents are available for free download. Uh, so how does the OPEX leadership move from ideation to adoption? Uh, there is a clearly established process for uh, collaboration between uh, CPGs and OEMs. Uh, 
Uh, most often, they, uh, the topics begin and develop out of PMMI forums. Uh, that could be the Top to Top, uh, Vision 2025, and you know, the PAC Expo events, uh, and of course, uh, uh, the on, uh, online and uh, publications for the PMMI uh, media group. Um, uh, those topics go to the OPEX Executive Council. There are about 40 folks that serve uh, CPGs that serve on that OPEX Executive Council. Uh, the OPEX Executive Council takes the particular topics under advisement, uh, develops a task force. That task force, in turn, uh, determines whether there is a solutions group to be formed. Uh, once that solutions group is formed, that group begins to get to work to develop that work product. Uh, we then pilot those work products in factory uh, in, in a factory or a facility for one of the CPGs. Uh, and of course, we take a look at the experience that has come from that, the data, the metrics that uh, uh, that spring from uh, those pilots, uh, uh, analyze that and ultimately uh, complete the document uh, and get it out for industry-wide adoption. So a solid ideation to adoption process. Uh, to give you an idea of what this looks like. Um, uh, these uh, solutions, by the way, uh, as I mentioned, are developed by industry for industry. Uh, these are not consulting groups or university uh, programs. Uh, these are actual CPGs and OEMs uh, who are uh, currently in industry. So all of these solutions are developed uh, by practitioners in industry for the industry itself. You can see from the um, wheel, now on the screen now, there are three primary areas that we work in, uh, people uh, and process and in projects. And what you're seeing appearing on the screen now are the 20 plus documents, work products that have been, uh, been produced uh, by the OPEX leadership in, the, in each one of these areas. Uh, workforce engagement and worker safety in the people area, uh, uh, CIP that uh, Jim just mentioned a moment ago that we're going to be uh, uh, drilling down in a of course, is the purpose of the webinar today. Uh, validation um, of the kill step and uh, heat process, low moisture foods, uh, validation uh, documents, and then on the products productivity side in process, a couple of OEE calculators and a remote access equipment document uh, to help OEMs and suppliers access uh, and help uh, CPGs troubleshoot uh, equipment uh, remotely. Um, uh, also on the sustainability side, discern, uh, journey of sustainability, as we move over into the projects uh, side, we have two of the most significant documents there and often uh, downloaded documents on requests for proposals and how to conduct effective uh, factory acceptance tests. And finally, perhaps the most frequently downloaded document in projects relates to total cost of ownership. So that is what the portfolio of uh, products and uh, that the Op OPEX Leadership Network has developed looks like, and the focus of today's, as I mentioned a moment ago, is this CIP document that you see uh, on the screen now, and by uh, way, it is available for free download. Now, to help us delve into this CIP document, let me introduce, uh, again, uh, Caitlin Lucia from Campbell's, and Caitlin, if you'd like, go ahead and kick us off. Thanks, Steve. Um, so prior to this document, there wasn't a cross-industry document on CIP. And our solutions group strove to provide definitions and actionable guidance uh, that could be leveraged across food plants. Um, several individuals were part of the creation of this document, representing food manufacturers, equipment manufacturers, and consultant groups. Um, and this is the collection of those representatives that worked on this document. Uh, we'll f start with a couple of basic definitions to get everybody on the same page. Um, so cleaning is the process of removing soils. Uh, your soil could be a, a product, it could be liquid, solid, particulate, it could be an allergen you're worried about, it could be buildup, scales, films. You have several methods for cleaning to, to use. Uh, clean, clean in place, CIP, which is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, clean out of place, manual assisted and dry cleaning. And the factors here uh, we're going to go through today for CIP. Here's a couple pictures for you of various cleaning methods. Um, <clears throat> most of you should be familiar with, with all of these. Cleaning, clean out of place is removing the components from the system and cleaning in a separate wash tank. Dry cleaning is just as it sounds, vacuuming or brushes. Uh, manual cleaning, anything that's, that's manual. 
Uh, sanitizing is the process of reducing the number of microorganisms present on a cleaning surface. Um, this is what we're not going to focus on today, uh, but we want to get it out there as a definition to be clear. So why would you want to clean? Uh, there's several reasons to clean and not all of us are going to have the same reasons to clean. Uh, it might be a, a chemical reason, allergens or glutens, or you're removing chemicals from your process. It might be foreign materials. It might be biological buildup, pathogens or spoilage. It might be a requirement from a regulatory agency. It might be to change between different products and maintain product sensory characteristics or to be in compliance with label claims such as organic or kosher or free of non-GMO. And it also might be operational. Maybe your heat exchanger doesn't work after 40 hours of processing and you need to clean it to remove the buildup. Everyone's reason is going to be different. Um, when you are determining your cleaning approach, you're going to ask yourself a couple questions. Uh, what do you want to accomplish? Cleaning, cleaning and sanitizing. What are we trying to remove? Proteins, allergens, carbohydrates, fats. What's the state of your solid, viscous, fouling, scale? And then what's your water chemistry? Um, do you want to use water, alkali, acid, sanitizer? Do you need special additives? And then once you answer all of those, you can decide uh, how do you want to accomplish it with CIP, an assisted cleaning, clean out of place, or manual. I'll hand it over to Brian Downer to get us through the five rules of CIP. Thank you, Caitlin. I appreciate it. Uh, as Caitlin said, you know, there's a lot that goes into how we're going to clean. Um, one of the big things we just we looked at as a group in OPX is what are some basic rules we can give people. And one of the first ones we we uh, landed on is really there's five fundamental rules about clean in place. One is uh, obviously, the system and the co components in the system have to be designed for clean in place. Um, seems simple, but it, uh, as we'll go through, it can be one of the more fundamental mistakes people make from time to time. Uh, second, it has to be installed to be clean in place. Again, um, when it's said, it sounds like uh, something that wouldn't be a concern, but time and time again, we find that the implementation, the installation of these systems is a culprit that allows it not to be cleaned in place. Um, active monitoring and adjustment, uh, just like anything, you want to be sure it's doing what you originally designed it to do. So we're going to go through some of the, the criteria there that are common in the industry. Recording and verification. This is a big one, um, really has become um, a topic of conversation after the Food Safety Modernization Act. This is where the uh, regulators are looking for, did your system clean the way you said it was going to clean, and can you verify that it, that is the proper way to clean it? So again, something we'll look at here in more detail. Uh, and last, and certainly not least, is preventive maintenance and calibration. And again, this is uh, keeping the system operating the way it was designed, the way it was installed to work, um, so that you know that on day one or day 1,000, it is operating in the same method, same mannerisms, um, same functionality. So if we go to the next slide, we'll talk about designing for CIP. So this can be a selection of equipment uh, to be cleaned in place. One of the fallacies that many people um, fall under is, is that if a piece of equipment is designed for a food process or even a pharmaceutical process, that it is designed to be cleaned in place. And that is not true. Um, actually, a good example is the picture at the bottom there of that uh, that pump. Uh, that pump is a uh, 3A certified pump. It is 3A certified for clean out of place. And if you're not familiar with 3A, 3A is an organization in the United States that works directly with the government. They're part of the uh, organization that sets standards for the design of equipment for uh, food production. So that is a good, great example of a pump that um, is designed to be for food, it's designed to be used in a food process, it's designed to be cleaned, but not to be cleaned in place. Um, uh, the, the other picture there is a valve. Again, um, we're showing the cross section of this valve. It has areas where soils can deposit and it can be difficult to be cleaned out. That would be an example of uh, something that would not be designed to be cleaned in place, um, even uh, regardless of its type of operation it would not clean without being taken apart uh, by its sheer design. 
One of the other organizations besides 3A that uh, helps in this is uh, EHEDG, the European Hygienic Engineering Design Group. You'll see the logo there at the bottom. Um, they are a uh, organization that harmonizes with 3A. The, stand, the guidelines and standards are not the same, um, but uh, EHEDG is used a lot in Europe, whereas 3A is the primary guideline here in the United States. So installing, if I look at the next slide, and we think about how we install this equipment. So you've selected the proper equipment, you have engineered it to be positioned properly, to drain properly, you've got uh, the proper line sizes, um, everything, the engineering is complete and done properly. However, um, the way things are installed uh, can matter uh, significantly. So if we take a look at a couple of pictures here, we have the first picture that shows a valve and there's a red arrow. Um, that is a dead leg. That area um, will collect product materials. It will never clean. There are guidelines in the, both the 3A and the eHedge um, documents that talk about this. But that is an example of, um, you know, even if those valves were to be uh, clean, uh, able to be clean in place, the way that's installed, it never would. Um, it would be a bacterial problem, regardless of how good your CIP system is designed. Uh, the second picture is um, an example of a weld. Uh, it may be difficult to see, but from the outside, that tubing weld looks fine. Um, you know, unless you've been a weld inspector for many years, you may not suspect there's a problem. But if you looked at the inside closely, you would see that it's actually not welded on the inside. Um, there is a significant crevice and a crack. Um, would be a major uh, bacterial concern. It would never clean, um, and it could certainly cause product integrity or you know, even health risk issues over time. So a craftsmanship, uh, the way the systems are laid out and designed, are they drainable? Do you have the proper slope? Um, if you have a long run of line, many times people don't like to add slope because it uh, is inconvenient, <laughs> but it is a necessity. So again, making sure that um, you're reading these guidelines for the installation, the proper installation of this equipment that is being done properly, that you're hiring trained um, contractors who are familiar with this, not just with welding materials, but with installing sanitary systems is, uh, is very important. So moving to the next slide, discussing active monitoring. Um, you have a system in place, a uh, process system is designed to be clean in place. It's been installed properly. Everything drains. Um, all you need to do is provide it with the right amount of chemicals and at the right temperatures and flows, and everything is going to clean properly. Then, and, and that's great. And on day one, when everything works, that's fantastic. But making sure that you're monitoring this, that you're maintaining the proper flow. If we look at this flow diagram shown here on this uh, slide, you'll see obviously we have a, a pump there at the bottom. It's, there's a strainer and a flow meter. Uh, the flow meter is controlling the pump. If you look at that the way, that loop is work uh, works. What we do there is we have a set point. We say we have to flow at a certain flow rate for this entire circuit for it to clean properly. We've documented that through our, our uh, verification and the flow meter makes that happen, makes the pump run at a certain speed so that we have the right flow. Same thing with the temperature. We have uh, a heat exchanger shown there in the ne next, uh, that's a steamed water heat exchanger and there's a control loop with the temperature transmitter so that we are um, sure that we are consistently providing the right temperature, not only throughout the cycle, but from one cycle to the next cycle, from one week to the next week, maintaining a consistent flow, temperature, and chemical concentration is very important. Um, it, sometimes these things are, are done manually. Uh, somebody goes and titrates chemical throughout the, the run. It's not a... Um, it's not a practice that typically is recommended because it requires human inter interaction and mistakes can be made. And there's no way of tra tracing or recording those things if you don't have electronic uh, means, which again is very important when we talk about uh, regula regulators and how they are monitoring your systems to be sure you're doing that properly. So not only being able to maintain throughout, but also being able to verify that what you've done has been um, is the correct thing to do. So recording and verification, you know, we have 
examples here showing, um, you know, our first example is uh, what's called a riboflavin test. Um, this is done extensively um, in the pharmaceutical uh, market, and we see it more and more in food. Um, this is an example of ma making sure a spray device inside of a tank is actually cleaning the tank properly. It's not a complicated test. Um, it can be done. There's many people who provide this service in the field, and it allows you a good verification that you have the proper spray device. Um, sometimes it can be uh, misunderstood that it, you know a spray device in a tank equals a clean tank, and it really does, and it has to be the proper device. It has to be designed not only for the tank specifically, but also for the soils you're planning to put in there. And uh, it's always a, a suggestion on, from my standpoint that we should verify these things. Um, on the bottom here, you see a picture of uh, a swab test. This is something that should be done consistently and periodically. Um, many customers do this after every cleaning in certain spots just to make sure this is being cleaned the same every single time. And, you know, these verifications that things are being cleaned um, are a way for us to know that our protocols, you know, those times, the temperatures, um, the concentrations of chemical are, 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 are suitable. But we also have to record that um, we're doing that that same way every time. And that's where electronic recording um, or, you know, some sort of a, a um, trace paper trail that of what we've done every time is done the same way every single time. Because if we verify that it works this way, we have to prove we've done it that way every time. Um, now, we have to do that. In doing that, we have to be sure that the system operates the way it was intended to operate. So if, uh, main, if we're not maintaining the system properly, not only the CIP system, but even our uh, process system, um, you know, an example here is instrument calibration. If we're relying on the instrument to tell us what the flow rate is, to tell us what the chemical concentration is, we also need to be sure that we're calibrating those instruments on a regular basis uh, so the instrument is reading properly. Um, in certain circumstances, people even use uh, redundant instruments where it's critical. So one instrument is always verifying the other. And if they vary too far from, from one another, there's an alarm that goes off and you know you have an instrument out of calibration. Um, strainers, simple and si something as simple as inspecting strainers, but you know it's important to have a strainer on your CIP system. You're cleaning, you're gonna pick up um, debris. Um, sometimes that debris can be um, undissolved product ingredients. Sometimes it can be foreign objects, pieces of plastic or metal. Um, so you wanna be sure you have something to capture that. So a strainer is a great way of doing that, making sure you have a regular uh, process for checking those. Warn elastomers is um, an area that many people I uh, will fail to uh, to think about, but you know a uh, a gasket between um, a fitting in your process system or in your CIP system has a reasonably short life, um, shorter than most people think. Uh, a lot of times, people will not replace an elastomer until they actually see a physical leak. Well, once you actually have a physical leak of an elastomer, many times that means that elastomer actually has been failing from a cleaning standpoint for a long time, even before it failed from a seal standpoint, as a mechanical seal. So uh, we see many people have a uh, regiment where they go through and they change their seals um, before they have a failure, just like they would change a pump or a valve seal. They'll change their tri-clamp seals. Um, on a regular basis, it may be every few months, every year. Same thing's true with pumper valve seals, as I mentioned. Those are also those where um, once you've actually had a mechanical failure, you probably have been having a sanitary failure for some significant period of time prior to that. So changing those things on a regular, uh, regular preventative maintenance schedule is important, not only from an operational standpoint, but also from a sanitary uh, sanitation standpoint. Next slide, please. So, designing for CIP, um, effective cleaning uh, really boils down to these six factors. And I like to start with time um, on the lower right there, because time is the uh, one thing that it seems everybody wants to reduce. <laughs> there's uh, as much time as we have in the day, um, there's never enough time, uh, it seems like, to get these operations done the way we like to get them done. So. 
we start with time. Anything, any other factor you see there is going to help you reduce time. Or, unfortunately, if not done properly, they can also increase the time because that tends to be the fallback when something doesn't get cleaned right, we spend more time doing it. The whole purpose of a clean and place system really is time efficiency. You um, are saving time because you're not taking the system apart and cleaning it by hand. Um, you hopefully you're pushing a button and the system goes into a cleaning mode. So in the essence of saving time, the first really is temperature. And, and temperature is critical, but it also has a diminishing point of return. In fact, um, you know, it's important to match your temperature to your soils. As Caitlin mentioned earlier, um, we have different soils we're, we're going to be cleaning. Um, they can be fats, they can be oils, they can be proteins, um, it could be minerals. So you have to identify those and then make sure you match a chemical to those and then match your temperature to your chemical. For instance, there are certain cleaning chemicals that will actually foam if they are below the temperature of say 125 degrees Fahrenheit and the foaming can actually uh, cause additional problems well as not cleaning and it certainly will increase your time to clean. So making sure you have the right temperature um, as well, although temperature is important, it can certainly help and speed up the cleaning. Too much temperature uh, can be a detriment. You can actually have situations where you will denature proteins and actually cause the system to be more difficult to clean if you overshoot a temperature. So correct and consistent temperatures are, are very important and it's not always the more the better in that case. Same really is true for chemical concentration if we move our way around. Uh, the chemical concentration, once you've selected the right chemical, um, making sure that you use the right amount. Too little, obviously, um, is, is no good. Um, you're gonna have, uh, take longer time the chemical over time as it uh, reacts with your uh, product, it's going to de diminish in its concentration. So you want to have a system where you're constantly maintaining that concentration. If you're doing it manually by having somebody, you know, physically check or titrate the chemical over the period of the circuit or the CIP cleaning circuit, that can be time consuming as well. You have uh, high and lows, and you can have the tendency in those cases to overshoot the chemical, which can also be a, a, a problem. Too much chemical, for one, it can be a waste of chemical, but it can actually create um, situations where you can harm your equipment. It can, uh, too high chemical concentrations can destroy elastomers, and actually in certain cases, it can actually even destroy the metal, the, stain, the stainless steel. So you want to be sure that you have the the proper chemical concentration and that you know what that is and working with your soils that you're trying to clean and your chemical supplier to find that right chemical concentration and then keep it consistent. Pressure, um, many times people don't appreciate, you know, they think, well, I have the right flow rate. I don't really need pressure, but pressure can be a great indicator, particularly when you're using certain devices like a tank cleaning device that requires a, a certain pressure to operate properly. Uh, many, uh, almost all tank cleaning devices operate based on a flow and a pressure. And so monitoring that pressure, particularly when you're serv uh, sending CIP solution to a tank cleaning device, is an important measure uh, and one I recommend, um, at, particularly as you get into more sophisticated tank cleaning devices. So good example of where pressure monitoring can be important. Uh, turbulent flow or mechanical action, this is our flow, our flow rate. There's a given flow rate for um, every size process line. Um, we use a general rule of five feet per second um, as a velocity. And uh, many we, we use that rule because we know that cleans the uh, branches of T's and some other uh, standard components well. Uh, occasionally people will move that flow rate up. And there's evidence to show that six or even seven feet per second can um, speed up the cleaning process, not as a linear relationship, but it, it does help. Um, there is a diminishing point of return with, with that flow rate as well. So, you know, going to 10 and 12 doesn't necessarily, hasn't been shown to necessarily help um, as some people might think it would. There's, but having the right amount of flow is important. And the critical thing here is, is to be sure you have the right amount of flow for the, the uh, equipment you're designing and plan to clean. So looking at uh, the equipment itself, 
the uh, flow conductivity and temperature measurement. Here's a good example of, of how that works. Uh, return controls, cleaning duration is recorded on your cleaning. You've got uh, fluid properties, um, uh, feedback on your uh, heat, heat transfer so that you have uh, control of your heat, you have control of, uh, and you're recording that as well. Uh, this is a good example here of a single tank uh, supply, CFP supply system. So it's important to have the uh, monitoring in the proper place. And here um, we are making sure that what you know, having those controls on the return side, that everything that um, in the circuit has seen um, the least or the coldest um, material. So we're not uh, hoping that everything that goes out comes back the same way. So good example of having equipment placed in the right spot. So I mentioned before, um, single tank, uh, single use system, different types of CIP equipment you would have. Um, single tank systems are great. Uh, they're, they're small, they're flexible. Um, you know, you can uh, use different types of detergents and concentrations. If you've got um, a small system to clean or if you have an allergen um, concern. Um, single tank systems are uh, are a good good opportunity or a good piece of equipment to use. Disadvantages really um, they use significant amount more water and more chemical, um, and there is a, a significant time delay to reach temperature as well as to change and dump in between cycles. So it certainly is takes longer um, if you're using a single tank system. Whereas um, our next slide shows a, a two tank system. So versus a single tank system, looking at a multi tank system, um, or what's sometimes referred to as a reuse CIP, we have multiple tanks uh, where we can store uh, detergent um, or uh, acid product uh, solutions from one cycle to the next. This allows us basically to reuse um, a lot of the energy, a lot of the chemicals. We're not dumping that down the drain. Um, this is what we see most commonly in the food industry. Um, obviously, uh, lower cost of chemical and water usage. Uh, we have faster heat up times because we've already um, gotten these systems up to temperature. And each step, our rinse, our wash, et cetera, have their own dedicated tank where those solutions are coming from them. So um, typically uh, very common for what we see in the food industry um, is a multi-tank system like this. We look at um, moving to the next slide. Some considerations when we're looking at uh, sizing the CIP system. So the wash tank size um, is um, important. It's not terribly complex, but it can be trickier than some people think about how. So we've given some examples here of how you would. Uh, size a wash tank and uh, it's important to work with your suppliers who's supplying this for you um, they can oftentimes can help you figure out but it does need to be designed per your circuit a generic size wash tank uh, might work but um, it could cause you more problems than sizing it properly same thing's true with a rinse tank important thing for a rinse tank that it's oversized to recover the increased volume of rinse water because as you rinse you oftentimes are going to be adding makeup water so again, important to uh, work with your vendors to be sure you're sizing this properly. A question that comes often is about heat exchanger sizing. General rule of thumb uh, the OPX group um, uses is a 30 degree uh, Fahrenheit rise per pass. So every time the water moves through the heat exchanger, it is uh, gaining uh, roughly 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, reason for this, you have heat losses as you're cleaning, so you need to make up those heat losses. You also have uh, you know some um, uh, fresh water being added in which will be coming in cool and so you have multiple areas where you're going to be losing heat and need to regain it you don't want to gain heat too fast because you can actually have thermal shock um, so one of the concerns at times has been that uh, you know I'm adding too much heat and the system can actually be uh, shocked by that so again good rule of thumb is 30 degrees per pass moving on Piping, so flow rate through piping. I mentioned earlier, um, rule of thumb of five feet per second of, of uh, getting proper flow through any size, any pipeline size. Here we show that as a three inch um, line is 102 GPM. 
a four inch line is nearly uh, 200 GPM. So we can get into very uh, significant flow rates as you try and uh, maintain that. If you choose to go to a higher flow rate, um, again, even more, even more flow required. So you can see that the demands on the CAP system can be great. Uh, the design itself, um, you know, free draining, slope to drain. We show here eccentric reducers. Um, very important to use those, particularly in horizontal lines. Um, dead legs, um, T, short outlet T's are very important. Um, there's uh, guidelines for what those dead legs should be, but um, anywhere you have a spot, if you don't know what a dead leg is, it's basically a spot where flow cannot go from in one end and out the other. So uh, the branch of a T or um, the side of a, a T that has a pressure gauge or something like that, flow can go in, but it has to stop and turn back and go the other direction. So those are dead legs. It can be very difficult to clean. Important to make those as short as possible. Um, make sure your elastomers are compatible, of course, and separating, always separating production from CIP solution. And it's important to have that separation by more than just a valve seat. Um, one single valve seat, if it leaks, which they can do, um, is going to put CIP solution in your product, and we don't want that. So important to have clean brakes or double block and bleed or mixed proof uh, functionality somewhere in your piping design. Valves and piping circuits, um, you know, be sure you pulse your valves. A valve seat needs to be cleaned. It has to be lifted for that to be cleaned. Um, there are cavities in those valves that uh, need to be cleaned by pulsing the valves. Um, it's good, important to close against the flow, particularly with a stem type valve, because you know, otherwise you get hydraulic shock. And then sequence pumps and valves to avoid hydraulic shock. Again, um, this is where you consult your engineers. Tank nozzles. Um, the tank nozzles, the ports in the tanks, the manways, um, those are the most difficult areas to clean in the, in the vessel. Um, try and keep those as few and as short as possible um, are important, as well as keep the diameter of those ports small. Uh, a larger port is easier to clean. It's easier to get solution sprayed into it. Spray devices, um, uniform coverage obviously is important. Sometimes if you have uh, certain types of product that um, Saturation from the outside is not uh, going to clean it. and You need to actually penetrate through the crust of the product. You might want to look at different types of uh, jetted spray cleaners like we show in the picture on the far right there um, in the tank. And then uh, CIP uh, return pumps. The uh, CIP return pump is um, always going to be designed so that it is being starved of flow. It should be uh, flowing greater. Um, so the capacity for the return pump should always be greater than the capacity for the supply coming into it. This way we never build up what we call a bath ring or bathtub ring in the bottom of the tank. Um, as soon as water falls through the bottom of the tank and into the return pump, it's pulled away. So um, again, just small uh, but important uh, aspects of designing a system. Next slide. So as we look at controls and automation, um, you know, uh, it's a, uh, th these systems that we've talked about, um, they, they do need to have um, automation component to them, uh, you know, the flow rates, the concentrations, um, even the recording, um, you know, is highly suggested that it be automated. The computer takes care of this. Remove that human interaction, remove that human error. Um, one of the biggest things to consider on your controls and automation is that you have proper security levels. Um, you know, it's um, controls is not a uh, is not a, a new thing to food plants by any means. Not a new thing for cleaning. Been using it. Been using automation in, in uh, cleaning for decades. But as these systems get more sophisticated, they get easier to use. They also get easier for people to get into and change things that shouldn't be changed. And your cleaning system, it's a recipe. It needs to have integrity. So making sure you have proper lockout. Is, is critical in that case. At this point, um, I'd like to pass it over to, to Caitlin again to talk a little bit about uh, the documentation of all these uh, aspects that we've discussed so far. So, Caitlin. Thanks, Brian. Um, so as Brian talked about before, documenting your process and, and recording your flow, concentration, and temperature versus time for your CIP is important to prove that you did what you said you were going to do, and then it also alerts you to any problems that you had during your cycle. 
um, without having someone stand there to watch it. Did it take two minutes longer than it usually do, does? Does it take a little bit longer to get up to concentration? Is your flow um, a little bit less than it used to be, but still above your minimum? Uh, so it, as well as uh, keeping the regulators happy, it also helps you troubleshoot later if you keep an accurate document of how the CIP cycle went. It depends um, on your industry and, and your plant, how old it is, whether or not you have a uh, fancy electronic recorder like the one shown here, or you have something simpler uh, like a paper chart recorder, um, but both would be adequate to, to cover your documentation needs. Uh, next slide. We're going to go through a, a short example CIP process, um, and I want to heavily stress example. Um, everybody's process will be different depending on the soils that they're trying to remove or the environment in which they are operating. Um, so this is purely for example purposes. One or more of these steps might be added or removed depending on, on the particular application. Um, so every every cycle kind of starts in this uh, this way uh, with preparation. Once you come out of production, you have to prepare your system. Um, a pre-rinse, um, your wash cycle or cycles, another rinse, and then a, a sanitizing. That would be the optional one for a lot of industries and then a final rinse and back into production. Next slide, please. So preparation, often overlooked, um, but very important. <clears throat> when you're going in from production into CIP, you wanna get rid of as much product as possible from the, the, the system. It only takes longer if you leave a lot of product in there to do your CIP. And in this step, you'll also be changing any positions on swing panels or removing any components that have to be cleaned out of place making sure you have enough chemical and whatever other pre-start checks you have to do. The pre-rinse removes the, the gross residual product soil from your system before you start introducing chemicals. You can use um, different technologies to determine your rinse length. You can use turbidity, pH, conductivity, um, and then you can reuse the recovered rinse water for pre-rinse if that works for your process. Next. For washes, typically in the food industry, we use an alkaline wash or a caustic wash. Um, it's most effective for proteinaceous and organic soils. And your temperature and concentration that you pick would be based on your soil load and your, your particular soil. After your alkaline wash, you're going to go into an intermediate re rinse um, to separate your caustic from your acid. And you can measure your effective rinse with conductivity or pH. An acid wash is usually used to, re to remove the mineral deposits. And a uh, note of caution, not to go crazy as, as Brian talked before, because overdosing can damage your 300 series stainless steel, which would not be great. Final rinse, you wanna remove your acid from your system and avoid um, sending any into your product on your next step. And you can measure that with conductivity or pH as well. And then for some industries, sanitation is included in the CIP process. This would ensure destruction of pathogens, micro. You can use thermal or chemical means, and depending on what means you're using, you may or may not require a rinse following sanitation. Sanitization, sorry. Um, so here's a typical cycle or a, a fake chart that I, I drew up um, to show you each one and what it would look like. Um, the first here is the pre-rinse. So you're at a zero conductivity. You're at a slightly warm temperature um, pre-rinsing your system. Next, it goes into a caustic cycle or an alkaline cycle. Can you go to the next slide? So you'll see your concentration increasing and your temperature increasing as well. On the intermediate rinse, you're keeping your system warm um, so you don't cool down and take forever to heat back up again. And you'll rinse back to a zero concentration. On the next, you'll go to your acid wash. Um, where you see an increased concentration and increased temperature as well. And then finally, your final rinse, you're bringing it back down to a zero concentration and you're bringing it back down to a cool temperature. You see the, the flow pulsing back and forth and that is, uh, that's the pulsing that Brian talked about before to make sure you're cleaning your valve seats without hammering uh, your system to pieces. So then validation and verification. <clears throat> for validation, anytime you have a new system or you have modified the system or you're bringing in a new product or a new soil, you want to challenge the system. 
to make sure that both the controls are set up, the recipe is set up correctly, and then you're getting the cleaning efficacy that you want. Um, you're, at the end of running a sample cycle, you'll choose some parameters and run it. Uh, you'll do a visual inspection, maybe an ATP swab or a micro test, and you'll do it multiple times to make sure you get the same result. If you pass those, re those results, um, then that's your validated CIP process for that system and for that soil. If you were to change something later or add something later, you would do it all over again. And that gives you your, your validated CIP. Then on an ongoing basis, you want to do verification that your validated CIP process is still effective. Brian also talked about this, of doing a visual inspection, doing um, swabs periodically, either after every run or once a month or whatever frequency uh, makes sense for your application. You might titrate your chemical solutions or titrate your rinse water to make sure you're getting an effective rinse. I'm gonna throw it back to Brian to wrap us up. Thank you, Caitlin, I appreciate it. So um, again, you know, we started this off saying there were five basic rules. We wanna design for CIP, use the proper equipment. We wanna install that equipment uh, properly. And uh, we want to actively monitor and adjust, make adjustments. Uh, record and verify, and then maintain and calibrate. So I uh, hope we've uh, given you some examples here of, of how you do that, uh, maybe raised more questions and answers. That happens sometimes. But uh, if we move on to the next slide, and uh, we'll pass this over back over to uh, Mr. Perry. Next slide, please. Thank you, Caitlin and Brian. Uh, now, each speaker has prepared some frequently asked questions. We're gonna run through those for you now. And if you have additional questions, please contact uh, the speakers at the email addresses that you see on your screen. Uh, so the first question is for Caitlin. How do I know what chemicals and concentrations to use for my process? Sure, so I won't be able to give you a fantastic answer because it depends. Um, it depends on your product, uh, your soil, um, what kind of degradation you're seeing, but most likely uh, your chemical supplier, if you send them your product or describe your soil, um, they'll be able to recommend uh, a given chemical or selection of chemicals and do cleaning efficacy testing on your soil. And they'll give you a guidance for temperature as well to run those at. Very good. And uh, Brian, how do I know how long to make my cleaning cycles and at what temperatures? Well, a lot like Caitlin uh, has, has mentioned, it's really predicated on your soil, uh, the product you are using. One of the things we didn't address earlier is even your water quality. Um, it's important to make sure your water hardness isn't affecting the efficacy of the chemical. Um, and that's, uh, that's something you work with your chemical company on. But uh, the length of time is really going to be a matter of the uh, effectiveness that you've done through your verification process, your ATP swabs, et cetera. If it's not adequate, you run it for more time. You can also adjust uh, you know, temperatures as well. Oftentimes, that's going to be predicated, again, by your chemicals. But again, check, verify, adjust um, until you get the, uh, the, the results you're looking for. Very good. Uh, Caitlin, how do I retrofit my process systems for CIP? Sure. So since, I guess, designing for CIP, we, we hit on several times as key for having a CIP-able system, uh, you can't often snap your fingers to retrofit it. Um, you can start with the available standards uh, and audit your existing process against those. Um, it, are the components CIP-able? Do I have the, the right installation? like Brian went through for uh, dead legs and um, good welds, um, and then start tackling them one by one until you have something that would have been what you would have designed if you were starting out fresh. Uh, you can also do the, the riboflavin testing to, to check your vessels um, as well, if there's those that weren't designed for CIP in the beginning. Very good. Uh Brian, can I recirculate rinses to conserve water? That's a good question. Um, do get asked that quite a bit. The um, interesting thing in the food industry, it's typically not been done, but it actually is done in the pharmaceutical industry. It is not 
as easy as it sounds. You can't do it effectively with a standard CIP system, but there are ways to do it. Um, and in some cases, um, there's a need uh, need for that. But uh, yeah, it, it can be done. There's no regulation that says that you cannot, um, but it's a general rule of thumb. People typically don't in the food industry. Hmm. All right, uh, Caitlin, how do I make my CIP process shorter, faster, you know, finding efficiencies? It's the $100 question, is it? Um, Brian also touched on this one before in our presentation. You're going to use your flow, temperature, concentration, or your particular chemical as levers to decrease your time. Obviously, within constraints, um, you can also look at your prep step are you leaving too much gross contaminant in your system that makes the CIP take longer? And would it be worthwhile to uh, remove more of that in recovery systems or air blows or some other um, removal of your gross contaminant before you be begin CIP to shorten your overall time? Okay. All right. And uh, Brian, uh, back to you. What can I do if I don't have the drain capacity to handle the waste flow from a CIP system? So one of the things we didn't address and um, is waste capacity of a facility. You know, it's not only do the floor drains handle the, uh, the effluent you'll be dispensing in a rinse, because that rinse, as we talked about, you know, if you're a three inch line, it's 102 GPM, your rinse needs to be at that flow rate you could have 100 or even 200 gallons per minute of, of water go into your drain. So not only does your waste system um, need to be sized to be able to handle the chemicals or the potential solids that are coming to it, but can the drains handle it? And if it's at temperature, are they designed to handle the temperature? Um, so those are it's an infrastructure question. If um, there are things that can be done um, that um, – can be de designed into the system to allow for smaller drains. Uh, there's opportunities to retrofit where you can add um, reservoir tanks that handle that effluent and hold it, and then uh, basically disperse it at floor flow rates. You can use recirculated systems that um, are uh, allow that flow to go out at uh, a lower flow rate than what the demand for the cleaning is. But yeah, there are, there are ways to go about that, but it's an important aspect to uh, to be thinking about in your infrastructure, uh, our floor drains and waste capacity. Very interesting. Yeah, very, very interesting. So uh, Caitlin, if you'd want to swap out my single tank system with a multi-tank reuse system, what do I need to consider or maybe watch out for some pitfalls? Sure. Uh, the biggest two obvious ones are space and cost. Um, you have to justify your, your multi-tank system and you got to find a, a home for it. Um, but then after that, you want to look at allergens. Um, are, is, it, is it possible for you to, to cross or reuse um, your fluids? And then and one thing that people don't usually think about is because you're reusing your, your fluids, you're going to end up with some soil back in your CIP system. And so you have to and come up with a way to periodically clean your CIP tanks as well so they don't have buildup in them. And, um, those are the, the big three, I would think, for swapping out from a one tank to a multi-tank. Very good. Uh, uh, Brian, how do I know if I need a 3A compliant CIP system and what are the benefits to the organization? So, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, for those who are listening or aren't familiar with 3A, it is a, a guideline that's used in the United States. It's actually um, the FDA and the USDA are part of writing these. It's actually a standard, an ANSI standard now. In the dairy industry, it's highly used. The regulators typically will be the ones telling people you need to have this 3A certified, um, or I highly suggest that it be 3A certified. Uh, but oftentimes it's used in other food industries um, as a um, uh, as, as a method for assuring that the system has been designed to be sanitary and clean and as cleanable as um, I guess the highest cleanability level. And that's really what that does for you. Is if if your regulator is not requiring it, um, but you want to assure that you have a system that has been designed at uh, the highest level of of hygiene for, for food, uh, 3A is a good way of, of uh, complying with that. The benefit, obviously, is the assurance that it has, it is meeting in design and functionality, um, you know, a, a standard, because that is the, 
the uh, ex uh, de facto standard here in the U.S. All right, and Brian, uh, again, uh, do I need electronic record keeping of my cleaning process? So, uh, as Caitlin mentioned before, uh, you know, a chart recorder, uh, charts from a chart recorder or a paper uh, record are perfectly adequate um, and meet the requirements of the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, there is significant uh, benefit to electronic record keeping, and we're seeing more and more people do that post both in uh, on-site and cloud-based systems. The advantage is, is that um, that record is easily accessible. Um, it's, you know, you, you don't have to worry about, well, where did we put that chart? Did it get wet? <laughs> you know, uh, did we misplace it? Um, and uh, multiple people within the organization can monitor those things. So, no, you don't have to have electronic record keeping, uh, but we're seeing more and more people move that direction because the uh, technology is just there to do it. And, uh, Caitlin, how about Campbell Soup? Do you have electronic and, and paper? Or? Yeah, it depends on, on the particular system or, or age of the equipment and building. Um, but as long as it complies, we, we have uh, we have things to support it. Good. So finally, uh, for both of our guests, uh, how do you go to management and justify the investment uh, in a centralized CIP system? Caitlin, let's start with you. Is, is there any kind of argument from the uh, you know, people allocating uh, funds that you you need this and you got to comply. Sure. The, I mean, the biggest thing is time, really. Um, Brian touched us before that. That's really what turns your ROI over. Um, is that a centralized CIP system, if properly designed and um, installed, can can really cut down on the the time that you're cleaning and that. That allows for more time for production, and it's fairly easy to use that as justification, um, or at least financial justification. Exactly. And uh, Brian, any tips from, from, from your end at Santamatic? Yeah, time is, you know, more time for production. That's the big one. Uh, we see uh, uh, more and more people actually uh, doing it for labor savings. You know, they're just not able to find the labor maybe to do uh, mm -hmm. some of their more manual processes, so they want to do the labor savings, and you know, reducing the human interaction reduces reduces the risk. Um, so there's the risk factor as well. But uh, time's usually the big big one if you're moving to a to a centralized system. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you both very much for joining us uh, here today. And uh, Stephen Perry, where can people find out more about OpEx and uh, upcoming webinars? Well, Jim, thank you so much. Uh, Caitlin and Brian, let me thank you for uh, an outstanding presentation this morning. And Jim, thanks to you for uh, moderating us uh, through this session. Um, with this uh, CIP uh, webinar, this presentation, you uh, all have had a chance to see firsthand uh, the breadth and depth and quality of these by industry, for industry work products uh, produced by uh, the OPEX leadership network. Uh, this CIP document, as you can see on the screen, along with all the others that I shared with you earlier this morning, are all available uh, at the OPEX leadership network. Org. You see the address there on the slide. You go to that site, you can see uh, all of the documents there. And again, once again, they're all available for free download. Uh, so guys, in conclusion this morning, on behalf of PMMI and uh, PMMI Media Group and the OPEX Leadership Network, uh, we'd uh, certainly like to thank our speakers this morning, and we'd like to thank uh, all the participants, uh, the listeners this morning, for participating with us on the webinar. Thank you so much, and have a good day.